All right. Well, while Tom is getting set up, uh, I wanted to see how many folks actually have been Java developers, not necessarily Java developers now, but have done Java development in the past. Yeah, the majority. Uh, and uh, how many of you don't want to go back? Yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, we've, one of the problems that we've had with JRuby is trying to actually push the idea that JRuby is not about Java. JRuby is about Ruby. And unlike a lot of other dynamic language implementations for the JVM, we have taken the approach of trying to make it as compatible as possible so that we can actually run all the apps that you're used to. So hopefully, uh, as we go through this talk, you'll keep that in mind, that this is really about just making another version of Ruby with some different characteristics that can do all the same things your uh, beloved C implementation can do. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about JRuby. Um, as I saw yesterday, pretty much everybody knows what JRuby is, so we're not going to give a lot of introduction to it. I am Charlie, Charles Nutter. This is Tom. We both work for Sun, obviously. Uh, I, I opted not to wear the Sun shirt today. I, I tend to do that a little bit too much at talks. Uh, but we're both engineers at Sun, uh, staff engineers or senior staff engineers or whatever it is. We've both been doing Java for about 10 years. Uh, but we have a lot of other uh, experience with a number of other different technologies. Um, we've both played with a number of different dynamic languages on a lot of different platforms. and So we've got a fairly broad background. But primarily, we've both been Java developers for the past 10 years. And uh, now, our goal is to try and make Ruby a first-class language on the JVM. And by a first-class language, I mean anything you might have done in Java before, you could now do with Ruby. Uh, we are also trying to take what we learn from working on Ruby and make the JVM a better place for all dynamic languages so that the enhancements we're able to bring to Ruby we can bring to others just as, just as well. So here's the agenda. Uh, I'm going to try and be a little inflammatory on some of this stuff. Uh, this is really a talk about why JRuby over the C implementation. Uh, not that we recommend that you're going to use JRuby for everything, but there are certain scenarios where you may want to start looking at it. So, First off, I mean, you know what JRuby is. It's a Java implementation of Ruby, but it's been around for about five years, five or six years now. Uh, it's open source with a couple different licenses, so you should be able to use it for whatever you want. And uh, we've got a really large and growing community of contributors. We have two other committers that are not from Sun, and we have about 30 to 35 folks that are regularly contributing patches and bug fixes. And just Oh, just to quickly point out, we're not the actual founders of this project. We adopted it, so adopt open source. Yes, that, that's a good way to uh, to get your name out there for sure, but uh, it's also fun to try and take over something and make it your own. Uh, like I said, we're trying to aim for compatibility with the current Ruby version, um, and then also add the other Java features, being able to call Java libraries directly pretty easily. Uh, being able to call Ruby from Java as easily as possible. And there's a number of these other projects that are also spinning up uh, based on JRuby, like the JWC-based Active Record Adapter and a couple other things, the Rails integration, WAR file stuff that I showed yesterday. So these are the overview bullets for the next few slides. Uh, a lot of people wonder why you would want to run Ruby on Java. And really, this is more like, why would you want to run Ruby on the JVM, since the JVM isn't necessarily about Java, the language. Uh, these are... A these are the ones I'm going to cover. I'll just, I'm going to jump into the detailed slides here. So starting off, Ruby design issues. These are, I'm going to go through a few things that are concerns that a lot of people have with Ruby as it goes forward and it's used for larger applications, uh, used for broader applications. Uh, the threading issue is, is one of the big ones. The fact that Ruby is still completely green threaded means that if you want to be able to scale it on today's machines, which almost all now have multiple cores, you need to have multiple processes running, which is much more difficult to manage in general to make sure all those processes continue to work correctly, to make sure they communicate across processes. And that's, that's troublesome. Uh, there's also the fact that in the C implementation, if you call out to a C library, and it doesn't want to come back, none of your other threads are ever going to execute again. You're stuck. There's no way that you can get those to yield unless they know about Ruby internals and know how to do that yielding to other threads. So it's tricky. Uh, there's also a little more 
internal detail about the Ruby scheduler. Ruby scheduler is what they call a time slicing scheduler, but it is a strict 10 millisecond time slicing scheduler on all platforms. So if you're running on the slowest machine possible, 10 milliseconds per thread. If you're running on the fastest machine possible, 10 milliseconds per thread. Every major operating system now has an adaptive scheduler, so this does not scale appropriately to the different machines that you're going to be running Ruby with multiple threads on, ignoring the fact that they're not actually going to run on multiple processors. Now, Ruby 1.9 fixes a lot of this stuff, uh, but it doesn't actually allow you to run those threads in parallel. It does add in native threading, uh, but they're all basi basically waiting for the, big, the same giant lock. The problem with Ruby 1.9 is that although native threading has been added in, uh, none of the work has been, doing, is, it has been done or is going to be done to make sure all of the internal libraries are safe for running multiple threads, which means that you can't guarantee the integrity of the runtime if you have multiple threads actually running in parallel. So it's part way. It's getting the native thread stuff, but it's not actually running them concurrently. Uh, I think that's about it for this one. The other issue with the, the threading is that in 1.9, they want all extensions to continue to work as much as possible. And since extensions are not aware of Ruby threads, they generally are, are not going to cooperate too well with uh, the threading model. The Unicode thing, which has been coming up more and more, is, is not a good story in 1.8. It's bad. Actually, when we uh, first started at Sun, they asked us, what is the situation for Unicode? Actually, they didn't even ask us. Uh, somebody else brought up that, oh, isn't there something with Unicode? So it doesn't support Unicode as well as uh, other platforms, or it's a little tricky. And they looked at us like we were lunatics. Like, why would you not support Unicode at this point? What year is this? Of course, I mean, seriously. This is coming from the organization that created Java and made Unicode a founding corner of it. Well, yeah, it's true. The thing is, they, they were all thinking about this in terms of web applications. And by W3C decree, everything that's on the web needs to have Unicode support. That's the transfer mechanism. And with Ruby not having solid Unicode support, that's a major problem going forward. And ask anybody that, that uses Rails a lot in uh, European communities. They were very unhappy with the situation up until 1.2, which finally added a Tacticon library for doing multi-byte support. 1.9 uh, is going to add support for Unicode and a number of other different encodings, but it does go, it, it's almost certain to break a lot of APIs because it is a, a very uh, aggressive change to the string class. It doesn't work with bytes anymore. It works with characters and counts are in characters. Uh, string bracket is returning single character strings rather than bytes, things like that. So it's going to be a, a migration period to actually move to the new string. And it's also not exactly clear how this is all going to wire together. Each string is going to be able to have its own encoding, but is this going to be efficient? Are you going to be able to mix encodings in the same app? Uh, what happens if you concatenate two, two strings of different encodings? Or uh, do matching of one encoded regular expression with another encoded string? Uh, it's not clear how all these issues are going to pan out, and that's not even, uh, we, we, they haven't started to address a lot of those issues in the 1.9 development. So the speed issue, uh, you know, Ruby is fast enough, and, and that's what I tell most people when I talk about it. But it is slower than a lot of other implementations out there, and that ends up turning a lot of folks off when they start looking at what language to learn next they don't want to automatically take a performance hit when they move to a new language or a new platform. They just won't. Uh, if you're running on something that is many times faster than Ruby uh, or you know, orders of magnitude faster, like Java, to say that you're going to take that hit the first day and, and some of the stuff is not going to run as fast is difficult to sell. Uh, it's, it's fast enough for some things, but it's not fast enough for a lot of people that are concerned about performance. I was just going to say it's a long-term perceptual problem for the language because it's getting this reputation as not being as fast. And even though it's fast enough, people always seem to obsess on numbers, right. as, as we will later. Yeah, and, well, and like another presenter said, it, people are re-implementing certain things in Ruby and having them turn out to be faster than, say, a C++ version. But it's not the rule. Those are exceptional cases in most, most cases. Uh, the other issue with this is that there's actually not a whole lot of plans to improve performance in 1.8. 1.8 is mostly frozen. So you're not going to see a lot of performance improvements until we get to 
1.9, where there are some improvements. Uh, most of you have seen the shootout, and we talked a little bit about it in the panel. Ruby 1.9 looks really good on Ruby 1.9's benchmarks. But uh, if any of you had a chance to read the serial interview with Mats and Koichi, Koichi actually admits that it's optimized for those benchmarks and that they have, he hasn't done a whole lot of work in the general case for improving performance. Those are specific things that he's targeted to speed up. So it's going to be faster, and I'm sure he's going to continue working on it over the next year. Year's a long time to continue improving performance. But there are certain things that we don't know whether he's going to tackle. We don't know if he's going to have a full ahead-of-time compiler or if it's just going to run the compilation every time it starts. Uh, we don't know if there's going to be any JIT. In, in fact, it's unlikely that he's going to be able to get to any JITting to actual native code. And uh, we're pretty sure from, from my talking with them that there's not going to be any change to the GC, the memory model, threading, other than moving to native threads with a big lock. So these are potential problems in the future. Uh, it's also the fact that it's not going to be here until December in any sort of beta. So it's, it's a ways out. Now, memory management. Dead, Jim. I got a battery flashing here. All right. Okay, I'll just use this one for a moment. Okay. All right. The cameraman will be happy. Uh, okay, so memory management. Uh, in 1.8, it's, well, in, in 1.8 and 1.9, it's a very simple design. It's basically stop the world garbage collector. So as you build up more and more garbage and more and more objects in the system, uh, you're going to get pauses in the entire application for it to go and clean up that memory. And that's, you know, that's kind of, uh, it's, it's a nice simple way to do garbage collection, but that's kind of CS 101 garbage collection for the most part. Even, even Rubinius has now a, a compacting generational garbage collector. It, so it's, it's, in, it's a, uh, not a great situation. The problem is that none of this is actually going to be changing in the 1.9 time frame. It's a large problem to try and change the memory model and to swap out, uh, swap in a new garbage collection system. And, you know, honestly, it, it's probably not the most important thing to tackle at this point. The thing I do worry about in 1.9, though, is if it's a lot faster, that's going to mean a lot more garbage. And you're going to have those pauses a lot more. It's not going to ultimately take away from the uh, gains from performance improvement, but it's going to become more and more visible of a problem until it's fixed. So we're going we're gonna to see this more and more in the future, and uh, it's, it, it, it's going to be an ongoing issue until someone's able to uh, address it. So extensions. How many people in here have written or used an extension? Everybody should have their hand up for extensions for the most part. Almost everybody uses extensions, right? Uh, and that is why Mots has probably wisely decided not to do a lot of breakage in those extensions. The situation with Ruby's extensions, I think, though, is actually holding back Ruby a bit. Um, in the few times that I've talked with Koichi about various design decisions and various potential changes, many of those, like changing the memory model, changing threading, changing other things, he ends up saying, uh, well... I can't change those because they'll break extensions. And that's kind of been the limiting factor on a lot of these features. So in 1.8, the C extension stuff seems to work pretty well. C is not the greatest language to write in if you're not used to writing in C, for sure. If you're, if you're coming to this from Java or another dynamic language, uh, you're probably not going to be the best C programmer, and C is not an easy language to write well. It's also highly possible that you're going to crash your Ruby VM, your Ruby interpreter, with a bad extension, or somebody else's bad extension, because if they behave badly, there's nothing to protect against that taking down the entire system. And I know a lot of people have had frustration with that, uh, in, with various extensions that, that may not be behaving like they should. Uh, I mentioned earlier this threading and, and garbage collection issues. If uh, you have C libraries creating, uh, allocating their own memory and managing their own memory, that's not going to be hooked into garbage collection. So you're going to have the same leaks that you might have to deal with in a typical C app. Uh, it's, it's also the, it's true that it's portable most of the time, but it does have to be rebuilt. And many times the extension may not work on your system of choice. 
Uh, this actually happens with folks that are trying to do Rails development on more unusual platforms. Uh, one of the applications for JRuby is somebody running Rails on JRuby, hitting a DB2 database in ZOS on a mainframe. And apparently, the combination of those things doesn't work so well in the C implementation. But with, with Java and JDBC, it just kind of works with JRuby. So Ruby 1.9 doesn't change any of this. And, uh, and really, the long-term performance advice that people seem to give out is write it in C. If you have a problem with a particular algorithm, go and write it in C. But we don't want to write C. How many people in here really, really want to write C instead of Ruby? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of expected that. But in general, we don't want to have to write in C, do we? We want to write in Ruby. And that's the point. So we need to find a way to make these things run well and perform well without having to drop to C whenever we have an issue. Uh, there are other issues. These aren't really design issues. And a lot of these are starting to go away, thankfully. But the politics of trying to get Ruby in to a large organization or an old or slow organization like, uh, uh, what, finance, banking, government, things like that, where they tend to move a little bit slower, uh, those are real issues. And people are not looking forward to making a switch off of a supposedly trusted platform like Java or potentially .NET to something that seems like a new kid on the block. Of course, we know it's not a new kid, but they don't know that. And they haven't heard these buzzwords for enough years to really accept this stuff. Potentially, we, it will be a better situation by 1.9, but it's not going to be, it's still not going to be easy to get it into a lot of these places. It's improving, but it takes some time. Uh, there's also a legacy. We've got a lot of Java apps and a lot of other applications out there in the world that are not written in Ruby and that may not be directly compatible with the C implementation. So, at least in the Java world, we've got an enormous library of Java libraries and frameworks. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad, but we have a large choice. Some might say too much choice. Uh, and we have a lot of developers and there's a lot of mindshare in that world. A lot of folks that are good. There's a lot of bad developers in the Java world, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of good developers out there. If the community only has 10% good developers, we're still talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. So it, it's, it's good to have a large community like that looking at problems. Uh, there's also been a large investment in Java infrastructure. And a lot of companies have put a lot of time and effort into getting servers up and running, getting people trained in, uh, getting tooling, getting all of the things wired together the right way. And they're not going to toss it out. They're just not. Uh, even if you tell them that, yeah, you can throw away 10 of these servers out of your 20 and you can run it in, on half the servers, or you can do development in one-tenth the time, they're still throwing stuff away. And people are going to be very reluctant to do that in the long term. So I'm going to hand this over to Tom, and he will go through a few ways that we have tried to address some of these issues in JRuby. So I'm going to talk about how JRuby addresses some of these things. And this is actually a talk in JRuby and not Ruby design. So um, the first thing is that we're natively threaded. Um, Java is a natively threaded language, so you get all the things you'd expect from that, the ability to run across all cores, for, for your code to actually run concurrently. And um, we've pretty much changed all the core classes to have thread safety. And the important thing here is that this is actually means that you can run multiple threads across multiple cores and even multiple JRuby runtimes in the same single process. Uh, you don't have to be spinning up N processes for your N applications or your N concurrent requests. It could certainly change how you actually design your application, knowing that you don't have to do, you know, some form of IPC or, or persistence somewhere. So it could have a big effect on how you actually write your applications. So the next thing is Unicode support. Java is built on top of Unicode. All the libraries support it. Um, you can encode and decode to your heart's content. But um, we're compatible with Ruby 185, so we, we fully support Ruby string, the bucket of bytes, as well as supporting Rails uh, chars class. And we plan on actually having a native version of that fairly soon. But if you want to break out, you can always uh, pull in Java string class and use that if you have some specialized Unicode needs that you can't do from Ruby. 
In a lot of cases, just actually having Unicode encoded strings in JRuby files are going to end up just working and passing them around to the rest of Java is going to work fine too. And actually, the situation with Unicode is such in Java that most Java developers don't even think about it because it just works behind the scenes. And in the Ruby world, people really have to think about, okay, now I'm going to have to do Unicode. Am I going to have to start calling in some other libraries, make sure that encodings are correct, make sure that uh, K code is set right for the libraries to do what they're supposed to do? All of those details uh, start to get a little tricky. Um, so the next thing, obviously, if you're working on an implementation of something, you want it to be scalable and fast. And we have a few ways of trying to do that. First is we've been doing a lot of work to actually speed up our interpreter. Um, we find no reason why we can't make it as fast as 1.8. Charlie's going to be showing some numbers of stuff a little bit later, so you can actually see our progress there. Additionally, um, we have some preliminary support for YARV within JRuby. It's enough to be fairly excited by it. Um, there's no reason why we shouldn't have the similar, similar sort of performance gains that Yarv's actually showing. And last and certainly not least, uh, um, Charlie's been working on compiling straight to Java bytecode. So that'll be supported both in ahead of time and just in time compilation modes. Again, Charlie's going to be doing a little bit more with that towards the end of the talk. This uh, last part, let, let Hotspot take over, is actually applies to all of these. In, in general, we want to just write code and have the JVM magically make things, you know, 10, 100 times faster. So it'll do dynamic analysis. It'll inline code. It'll compile down to native just based on what you're actually running versus, you know, a static design where you have to go and figure out where you think that code's going to be running and try to optimize for that ahead of time as a designer. Actually, all through the process of trying to improve JRuby, one of the big things we've done is just simplify and delete a whole bunch of code. Because as the, the JVM core guys keep telling us, don't try to be cute. Just write nice, clean code that doesn't have too many layers of abstraction and too many complications, and Hotspot will take over and optimize it. We, we recently found that we were being too smart um, because we had this large switch loop and we're doing continues and returns, and it seemed like a really efficient way to do it. We we're, we're being too smart, though, because once we actually extracted most of the bodies out of that, magically things got a lot faster, and it was unintuitive, but the simpler your code is, the easier it is for the uh, JVM to figure this stuff out and optimize well. Yeah. yeah, for those of you who know about inlining code and C optimization, basically we outlined a whole bunch of code, and the performance improved by... 40% or something like that, because Java was able to decide at runtime what the right way to inline it was. And so the next uh, next uh, JRuby feature is really just a Java feature. We're letting Java manage your memory. Um, I would say it's probably the best GC in the world. If, it, if not, then someone can be angry here and just bite their tongue. Um, but they've put a lot of time into it. Charlie was saying yesterday that they spent, you know, multiple decades worth of hours actually working on this garbage collector. And there's enough applications out there that, you know, have really high, highly available uptime requirements that, you know, they're managing quadrillions of objects and the system's not going down and it's not progressively getting slower. So why, why write a GC or a memory management system other than Evan? Of course, if you want to, that's great. Next thing is uh, Ruby has C-based extensions, and we have Java-based extensions. We find this uh, much more preferable to writing C. Um, we both used to write C, and we're pretty happy that we're not doing it anymore. Um, as Charlie was saying before, it's uh, almost impossible to actually crash on a Java-based piece of code for the VM, and our runtime rarely crashes based on extensions either. Um, I hate using this term, but I'm going to anyways. Um, write once, run anywhere, WARA. Uh-oh. Okay, question. This will run on any Java implementation that's compatible with 1.4. And we've only tested on a few, but what? 1.4 and above. 1.4 and above, yeah. That's right. 
But it, it, it is portable. You can, you can write an extension, and we don't have any real worries that it's not going to work on Windows. We don't have to play with automake and, and stuff to actually make sure that that function exists. It's, it gets compiled down to bytecode, and then we just ship that jar. Um, and this next one, no GC threading or security issues. Basically, because we're on top of Java, we're leveraging those aspects of Java, which, again, is a great convenience to us. We have an extension API, so we feel it provides some level of separation. And everyone knows Java for the most part. And politics don't get in the way. Um, since there's so many people that actually do use Java out in the production world, it's pretty easy just to go and tell those Java people that JRuby is just another library. So if you're a Rubyist and you want to use Java, you can just go and put that jar into your application architecture, and no one has to change any of their administrative processes, or, or you don't even have to have that meeting. And it's there. Plus, you know, 10 plus years of Java, a lot of people have it running in their servers. Well, the other half of this is that if you're a Rubyist and you don't want to use Java, but your organization does, you can still use Ruby. I mean, it is just Ruby in a library form that runs on the JVM. So you can still be a Rubyist in a Java organization. So this, this next point just pretty much mirrors what Charlie said before, that uh, there's plenty of Java code out there, plenty of services out there that you need to access. And JRuby can easily access Java code from within Ruby, so it's really easy to pull in that legacy Java code. I still get funny every time I say legacy and Java together. Um, but you can deploy to existing servers, and the JVM is pretty tried and true as far as being an adequate platform. So, so what can JRuby do? Um, we spent a lot of time actually making JRuby as compatible as we can with 1.8, and for the most part, most applications just run. So we, we frequently run Rake and Ruby Gems. We don't actually run their unit tests, but uh, um, they run well enough where we rarely actually get any complaints. And we're going to start running their tests anyway. We know there's people out there using RSpec right now, so that's good enough. We actually have some, what do you call them, um, specs passing versus test passing. We actually have some numbers on that later. Um, Rails keeps looking better and better. We're passing over 98% of the actual unit tests. And there's actually a few people using it in production right now. We, we hope that that starts improving quickly now. And for the most part, we see emails and blog entries of people that are just using Ruby applications we haven't tried, and they're just working. So we feel pretty good about compatibility. Ah, Ruby plus Java equals awesome. Double plus good. Um, so we've talked a lot about how JRuby gets a lot by using the JVM, but there's also these libraries, and they're comprehensive. I mean, there's pretty much not one library on the planet that doesn't satisfy any task that you can think of. Um, it's, it's that pervasive. But sometimes libraries suck uh, um, from a usage standpoint, like, like Gregarian calendar. That, that's no fun. Um, so, so Java's not, not necessarily a bad language for frameworks, and it certainly has a lot of them out there, but it has an ugly face. Putting Ruby in front of that face can make using those libraries pretty palatable and actually pretty powerful in, in cases, especially when you can put a DSL in front. And actually, most of the time when we actually test out Java libraries or play with some new framework, we write it in Ruby these days because we can just do that, and we prefer to do that because we don't have to do a compile sequence and make sure we have a main and a class and everything else. We can just call the damn class. Much easier than having to do all of that rigmarole to get something up and running. So more and more we've been using this metaphor that, um, the Unix metaphor, if, if you write a bunch of system libraries in C, you don't want to write a bunch of end user stuff in C. You actually go and have small applications and shell scripts and, and basically a higher level abstraction. And we feel that Ruby kind of fits the higher level of abstraction, and Java fits the C part. And in general, this is the sum is more than 
The sum of the parts is more than <laughs> more coffee. The whole, the whole is more than the sum. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll take over here. Um, so, you know, talking's fun, but, uh, but demos are more fun. Uh, so one of these examples of a library that is not particularly friendly would be Swing. Uh, has anybody done any Swing development or looked at that library before? It's pretty crazy, isn't it? How many love it? Yeah, yeah, not, not too many of them, not too many of them. Um, now, Swing, like most Java libraries, is designed with infinite infinite extensibility and flexibility in mind. And generally, you don't need infinite flexibility and extensibility. Uh, those things add complexity for the edge cases uh, at the expense of the common cases. And that's kind of one problem with the Java world, is that things are designed for the edge cases, just in case, because this is such a large platform, just in case someone needs to use them. So this is a project called JR Builder, and I think he's actually migrating it to the Cherry, is what he's calling it. Uh, it's a, basically a swing builder syntax, a DSL for doing swing applications. Uh, it's kind of inspired by Groovy, another dynamic language on the JVM, which also has a swing builder. But this one is written entirely in Ruby. It's about as fifth as much code as the Groovy version. Uh, it's also been inspired by uh, another language that recently came out of Sun called F3, which is kind of a declarative UI language. And uh, the F3 guy says it's completely different, but uh, it's, it's very similar. It's very similar in what it actually can accomplish. Uh, it also supports some data binding kind of stuff. Uh, there's additional enhancements that are coming in. But I'll, I'll just walk through some of the code and kind of show what this actually looks like. Thanks. Okay, let's see here. So... We have a terminal up. Uh, that looks pretty good. So uh, we have our little JR builder thingy here. Let's see. Examples. We'll take a look at one of the examples. Examples. We'll just look at one of the hello worlds. So here, you're going to basically kind of wonder where the Java code is. A lot of it's in this library, but this certainly doesn't look like Swing. So you get a new context in which you're going to do your building. And as we, we'll just walk through the code here. The first thing we do is just have an attribute reader for the frame. We create a frame with a title, set its size. We have a, a content pane in there that we, we're going to set the layout and some other, other layout details for it. Set an event so that when this is closed, we actually shut things down. Uh, we'll add a menu with a few options. And then we have just a label in the middle of this panel. And this is basically a swing application, but it has a much friendlier UI in front of it. It has a nice swing DSL for doing development. So this is a simple example. We'll quit out and just run this one. We get our swing logging information. And then we have a little basic application. So that's a simple example. Let's take a look at uh, a slightly more complicated one. Oh, let's look at binding one. So binding basically allows you to tie particular properties uh, of a UI to the fields of, or the fields of the attributes of a given class or object, so that when one changes, the other changes as well. So here we have another frame. We have an, our menu again. And then we have some sliders that will just basically track what's going on. Uh, down here at the bottom, we actually bind these sliders to a couple objects so that when the values of those objects change, the sliders update, and the sliders end up getting tied together. So I will run this one now. OK. So now with just probably the 10 lines of code that was there for binding stuff, we have these things all tied together so that they all react in concert. Uh, now, this kind of code, if you were to write it in Swing, you'd have to write listeners, maybe multiple of them, implement a few interfaces, uh, implement the methods that are contained within them. All you have to do with a library like this is tie those properties together, and they end up just following each other. 
So we make changes here, and this all just works across these things. So uh, it's, a good, it's a good example of what we can actually do for Java libraries. There's a ton of them out there. A lot of them are kind of ugly, but we can put pretty faces on it like this and actually make them usable now for the average person. You don't have to be a swing expert to be able to look at this code and figure out what's going on. Uh, makes it much, much simpler. And with that, we'll jump back into the slides. Okay. So that's kind of fun, and that's, a, that's kind of a developing project. It's coming along more and more. Uh, the other big one is NetBeans, and I'll turn it over to Tom to talk about this. NetBeans is done by um, a coworker, Tor Norby. He started it in September. He's pretty much a one-man show at this point, and we wanted to demo it because he's been making an amazing amount of progress. Like almost daily, there's a new feature that's showing up, it's based on top of our parser with a lot of extra code written by him. Um, it became available in NetBeans 6 Milestone 7, so you can download that, go into the Update Center, and then select the, the Ruby items, and it'll download the Ruby support. Um, I'm really just going to cover the editor features, and I just, I just want to take a step back and say there's an awful lot of stuff going on in this space. It seems like every single IDE maker is actually concentrating on a on a Ruby IDE. So for all the TextMate faithful out there, you know, maybe it won't float your boat, but there's a lot of stuff to look at. You can go and look at RDT, RadRails, um, Dynamic Language Toolkit, um, Ruby and Steel, which was just given out. Yeah, um, yeah. IntelliJ stuff. IntelliJ, JEdit, um, JBuilder, so, or JDeveloper. I think the Komodo guys have something or other, too. I don't, haven't looked at it. So uh, I'll fix this. So I'm basically going to reproduce this file, but I'm going to show some features as I do it. So the editor actually does a whole bunch of... Oh, this is... This sucks. Okay. So it indexes a whole bunch of stuff, so it can make a lot of smart suggestions for you. So... If I do REQ and then hit expand, it actually figures out there's probably nothing else there besides require. So now I want to go and do another expansion, but there's actually more than one selection. Well, it figures that out and it pops up some suggestions. So in addition to those suggestions, you can actually see the RDocs associated with it. So we want dir name. Now, um, this, this actually looks a little better when you actually have a sane resolution. Hopefully no one's using 800 by 600 for their daily life. <laughs> so, error file. Whoops. Happy fingers. You know, whenever you do a demo, you always start typing like a maniac. Okay, there we go. So you can actually see on this line that there's a number of different color highlighting. It, you would expect out of any IDE. Okay, so I'll do a test. Highlight. There's only one thing that's really worth highlighting there. Do another suggest. Fill that in. Cool. Puts the end in automatically. <laughs> Gives you a little folder thing there. Um, another nice thing is when you actually hit the suggestion thing on a class like this, you can actually pop up the RDoc for the class. So it's a fast way to look stuff up. And the coolest is I can actually go to declaration. So if I go to declaration here, it puts me into the actual file where test class is defined. Now, we all know that Ruby can actually open up multiple classes, so I'm not sure the exact heuristic here, but... It seems damn good. It seems to go where I want almost every time. So if we go over on this left side, I didn't point this out, but you have a traditional project and files view, and then we have a navigator. So if we look at the navigator, you can see all the methods that are there, the constants. We can click on it and jump to it, and we'll jump to 2S. Let's say we're tracing through something. We can jump to declaration again and... That wasn't real useful since it went three lines up, but you can get an idea from that. Do the control click one. I like how that looks better. Control click on name. 
Oh, control click on name. Okay. No. Uh. <laughs> Here, okay. I just want to show this because I like this one better. Assuming you can. I, I I'm a pretty pretty heavy Emacs user, so I've I've pretty much violated uh, every NetBeans key binding that I could. And see, most of these things end up getting highlighted as uh, being links. And this is basically what it what it would look like for you know a lot of folks that are just kind of looking for something they can click on uh, rather than just using a key binding. So it's kind of a fun way to actually jump around. I'll let you continue with that. Okay, so that was that. Um, we'll go back into our test case. We'll make a string. Well, actually, let's show this off first. So I, making a regular expression, I do suggest. And it actually gives you suggestions, and it also documents it. So if you can't remember what uh, graph is, you actually get a description. I think for, for new users, this is really helpful. And actually, you know, they try to do as much stuff as they can with context-sensitive highlighting. So if we try to do that in a string, you get a bunch of suggestions. I, I mean, this seems a little less useful to me, but it's, it's a nice idea. So we'll just put something in here. I'll do another thing. You can see that uh, variables that aren't used, that it can detect, it'll actually mark them as gray. I'll assert, and I never remember the name, so I'll do an expansion. Now you can see that the... <laughs> hey, I can show another feature. So I'll just finish that off. So if we if we highlight this, we can auto indent, which is cool, an accidental demonstration. And you can see that those gray things went away. And the last thing, we can actually do renames. So kind of useful. Um, one other thing I'm going to show, which isn't directly related, though, I suspect it'll become more and more integrated with this, is they threw in JRuby's IRB swing console in. So you can go and do whatever you want, just like you're in an ordinary IRB thing, but you don't actually have to leave your IDE. Um, there's some color highlighting, and there's some expansion. But in general, it's just for doing some esoteric Ruby thing that you've never seen before. So with that, we'll pop back in. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, NetBeans uses our AST and parser directly. Uh, actually, the details of how he's got that wired in, I'm not really clear on. He's tossed us various improvements to our parser and our AST, but for the most part, he's going directly at the AST and using that for the work he's doing. And our AST has been used uh, fairly pervasively by other other people trying to do JRuby editors, but it's, it's an AST that's basically a port of MRI, and it was really intended for interpretation. So there isn't an incremental lexer or incremental parser in it, so... There are actually some features that IDE developers would like us to do, but... There's also a, a number of changes that have been done over the past six months to a year to better support round-tripping the AST uh, so that it keeps track of, well, not, not really white space for the most part, but keeps track of where comments are associated and other details so that you can actually start doing uh, some of the refactoring features that are coming up in the IDEs. The debugger does not work yet, but there's work going on now, and I, I think it's getting merged into the, the main CVS repository pretty soon. And that, and a, another important point here is that you can tie this in with Ruby or JRuby when you run stuff. It's, you know, it's been mostly tested with JRuby at this point, but the goal is that this could be your general purpose Ruby IDE or Ruby editor for C Ruby development just as easily. Yeah, there's actually properties for you to actually change between the runtimes. So we'll, we'll move on. Um, measuring compatibility. We talked about this yesterday on the panel, but how do you actually implement a language with no spec? For us, uh, uh, 
the practice has been trying to get as many tests as we can. So we try to pull on every every test suite that exists, and for some reason in the Ruby space there seems to be a lot of them. None of them are particularly complete, but you put them all together and you get something more complete. So we got MRI zone tests, PFTS, Rubicon. Um, we have uh, unit tests or, or specs for um, R spec and Rails. Uh, we're also hoping to grab uh, unit tests from other implementations. And as we go on, when we don't find stuff, it's really convenient for us to just plop it into our own internal unit test suite, which is getting larger and larger. Um, so all in all, that actually isn't too bad of a system other than the fact that we might be testing the same things more than once. We just kind of accepted that that's going to come along with it. Um, there are also efforts, though, across implementations and across projects to try and pull together some of these things into a common suite. We've actually rewired a bunch of the Rubicon tests so that they're test unit based and they're a little cleaner. Um, we've contributed a bunch of the JRuby tests back to the Ruby tests project on RubyForge trying to sort of build up a common suite of tests, a common compatibility kit that people could use for Ruby implementations going forward. And so if you want to contribute to the spec, uh, Charlie mentioned this URL yesterday, but there it is on up there, so jot it down. Um, you can also go to our wiki and actually add any documentation. It wouldn't need be JRuby specific, though. If you want to do some JRuby specific documentation, please do. You can actually just Google Ruby spec or JRuby wiki and they'll come up too. So these numbers mostly show that uh, we almost pass all the tests. Uh, um, the largest problems we seem to have revolve around the fact that the JVM doesn't support all the POSIX functions. We can't do things like fork. We can't ask the file for what inode it is. So most of the tests we fail are, are because of things like that. And uh, for the most part, that explains all the uh, tests on here, except for maybe Rubicon. Rubicon hasn't actually been actively developed for the last year plus, and they actually can test any version of Ruby. So if you want to go back to Ruby 165 and see how it did, you can go and do it. But the problem with that suite is if it's not actively developed and you change behavior between 1.8 releases, all of a sudden you start failing tests where you're actually doing it right. So and when we've done our rework of Rubicon, we've actually ripped out most of the uh, version-specific stuff because nobody, nobody really needs a test suite for 1.6 anymore. We, we spent quite a bit of effort on, on Rails for our last uh, release, and this number is actually a little light. When we released, it was 98.2%, or I think it was 57 or 58 failures and errors. But as you can see, the, the core is pretty much close to 100% with some issues with active record. So we can spin the active record JDBC um, project really fast, and, and people are working on that. So yeah. those numbers should come up pretty fast. And for those who don't know, active record JDBC basically is just active record with JDBC backing it. So you provide all the same information you would for a normal active record connection, but it'll use JDBC libraries instead. And uh, that's largely where the work needs to be done to improve active record support. It's really not JRuby's issue at this point. Again, more of the same. Um, BFTS actually has a lot of tests for a few core classes, and they pretty much hit every corner. There's a few corners we're missing, but this is like one of these things where contributors really like to go and dig into one of these because we, we have them all listed as bugs, and we get a trickle of patches coming in for them. But... In general, we haven't really noticed these failures actually affecting real software. And of course, we pass our own unit test. Probably even more remarkable, our, our um, coverage reports show that we're hitting over 80%, exercising over 80% of our code. All right, so I'll take over here, because this has been my big area. Um, performance is a tricky one to deal with, because we don't have any standard suite of benchmarks, as somebody asked. Uh, there are a few suite of tests, but there's, there's even fewer uh, benchmark suites. There's the one that Ruby 1.9 has. Uh, there's various shootouts and things that have been around, like the Alioth ones, uh, the much maligned Alioth shootout tests. Um, but, you know, we don't really have a good, solid, cross-platform, uh, cross-feature set of tests that we can use. 
So it's a little tricky. We end up using uh, Ruby's, Ruby 1.9's benchmarks. We end up writing our own for specific cases to, to test things. Um, we try and be as general as possible, like rather than testing that FIB works exclusively or that it's running really fast, test whether method dispatch is fast or local variable access and try and work on those general cases more than specific cases. Uh, along the same lines, we also look uh, a lot at Rails requests per second and how fast we can run those in WebRick so that we're really, really pushing the interpreter as hard as possible. So like I say, we do Rails stuff. Um, we are still 100% interpreted in trunk. Uh, there's a the JIT compiling stuff is built is, start, is starting to get built in, but it's not turned on yet. It's not quite safe. Uh, the some of the Rails numbers are here, and this actually hasn't been updated recently. This is a uh, Ruby and JRuby both running under WebRick, and uh, I think it puts us around half, maybe a little better than half on static content, uh, and this is going to steadily go up. Uh, of course, if you take WebRick off the front, we do a lot better, but Ruby does a little better too when it runs with Mongrel. So we're kind of, uh, you know, in the 50% range at this and, point. And we do have a known I.O. bottleneck, which is affecting these numbers quite a bit. Right, right. A lot of this is not CPO overhead. It's just issues with the subsystems, uh, the I.O. libraries and stuff. So here is some of the uh, Ruby shootout tests. And, I, you know, I didn't, all the names aren't on there. It doesn't really matter. But this is the current state of JRuby performance in interpreted mode. Uh, this is runtime for all of these. Uh, JRuby is the red bars. Ruby is the blue. And in almost all cases, we are longer and uh, slower than Ruby. Although in, in several cases, we actually do get pretty close. Uh, let's see here. This guy... These guys over here on this end are pretty close. Uh, this one's pretty miserable. Both of us are terribly slow on that. Um, there are a few where we're faster, actually, in interpreted mode. We have uh, these guys here. This one here, or uh, no, this one, this one here. Just a few tests. And, and uh, there's a better view of this. This is an impossible one to really look at. But this gives you an idea of how many times faster we are in interpreted mode. And a couple weeks ago, only one of these was above the line. They were all below at that point. Uh, so it's looking a lot better, getting it close to, to two times as fast. Uh, but we've got obviously got a lot of areas that are, that are in trouble. And, and some of these guys hanging off here are, uh, are areas of focus. We've also been working on the compiler. Now, we want the interpreter to be as fast as possible. And I don't think there's any reason why we can't be as fast as the C implementation just interpreting because there's not a whole lot to it. Uh, we've been working on this compiler, and compiling Ruby is hard. It's really hard, because it's a very dynamic language. There's a lot of complexity to it. It has eval. Uh, you can generate methods anytime you want. All of that stuff makes it very difficult. So we do have ahead of time support, so that you can turn Ruby classes into a Java class file and distribute it like a normal Java application, although it's actually developing in Ruby. Um, you can run that stuff directly. But we also have realized that we're going to need some sort of just-in-time compilation. Because you can create methods at any time, because you can eval code, we want to be able to continue po compiling as the application executes so that you can continue to get performance for new pieces of code. And if you look at code for... Well, Rails is a good example. Camping is another good example. Almost all of the code that actually ends up in the application happens or is created at runtime all the important bits anyway. So we need to be able to compile those as we go. Uh, it also allows us to have kind of an incremental design so that for things we can't compile yet, we can fall back on uh, the interpreter to just run those pieces. It's a mixed mode uh, runtime, if you know anything about that. Uh, how, how are we doing for time here? A little over? OK, well, I will, I will skip the demo because you know it just shows a bunch of numbers scrolling by, right? But here is the performance of the JRuby compiler on the, uh, on the ones that we compile, the, the shootout tests that we can actually compile at this point. So I, I've got both numbers for JRuby, both running with just the time command from startup and running with no startup at all. So here is the one view, which shows that we're faster on uh, almost all of these here. A couple of them have some issues. But uh, here's a better view of it. So this is JRuby compiled how many times faster than 
the current 1.8 implementation it is. Uh, you know, on the average, around one and a half to two times faster. Some things are better here. This one actually is a, a bottleneck in our object space implementation. If we turn object space off, this one and all the other ones jump up a number of additional times, because object space is just overhead for us. So we're making a lot of progress here. Uh, we are hoping to have the JIT enabled by default by the time we reach 1.0 in the next few months. So it's, it's looking good for performance, and uh, hopefully you will soon have a, a, a very high-performing uh, Java VM-based Ruby interpreter to play with. So what's next? JRuby really is viable for development today. And I pulled the various JRuby lists before I uh, headed here to see what people are doing. And it, it runs the gamut from little utility scripts used in a build process to you know, moderate complexity production JRuby on Rails applications. And this is going to grow more and more. Uh, almost all of the major Java vendors are now looking at how they can better support JRuby and how they can start taking advantage of all the product productivity that Ruby gives them and all of the folks that are interested in using it. Uh, we are obviously approaching MRI on a lot of fronts. We're never going to be 100% compatible, but we can be 99% compatible. And, and we can probably run almost all of the apps that most people are interested in. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to bring out of this is that more and more Ruby apps are running. And a lot of Ruby developers have started to take the approach of trying to make sure their stuff runs on JRuby. Uh, Aslak, who created our spec, is actually going to start running his specs against JRuby on a regular basis to make sure that they continue to work on JRuby. So maybe you should look and see if your application will actually run. And if it does, that's great. Maybe you can include it in your regression tests or your continuous integration. Uh, maybe you'll send us bug reports if there's something wrong. So there's, there's really a, a great future here for having Ruby run on a very high-performant VM and being able to run alongside all the Java stuff that's out there. And here's the roadmap. We can go right into questions at this point if we, you know, unless you guys want to run out the door, feel free, but we can take some questions. We're looking at, uh, we, we, we jumped from 092 to 098 in our last release as kind of a, a vote of confidence that we're two releases away from 10, right? So 098 was just in March, and that was officially supporting Rails. It's got the compiler in it uh, available for people to use. Uh, lots and lots of bug fixes. In uh, April, we'll pull probably the last major changing release of JRuby, the 099, and then hit the bug stuff really hard, try and uh, line up a 1.0 release shortly after that. And I guess that's it. I mean, there's a bunch of links for all the stuff that I showed, and... We can take questions and filter on out, I guess. So thank you all for, uh, for listening. All right, so questions? Yeah, I've got one here. Um, great presentation, by the way. You started to get me excited. I didn't expect to be. Um, one of the things uh, I was thinking about is, uh, I think, a question asked yesterday about um, how to make Ruby applications um, packageable so that you can kind of send them out to the send them out to the world without anybody having to know that it's actually a Ruby application underneath um, how have you developed in that area what's what's the experience so far Sorry about that. well one of the big interesting features of JRuby is that anything that's on the Java class path any Ruby script can be picked up through a normal require for example so you can actually create a single file, a single jar file, Java jar file, that has JRuby, uh, all of the standard libraries, or you can trim it if you want, and your application. And you can just run it directly as a single file on any platform that supports Java without having to do any recompile, install of Ruby. Um, we're getting to the point soon where you'll also be able to include all the gems that you might have in that single archive and just run it directly. That's the goal. JRuby complete? Uh, yes, and, and one, we actually ship a version that's called JRuby complete, and it's a single jar with JRuby and all of the standard libraries, but all you do is java-jar this jar file, and it's basically like running Ruby. So from then on, you, get, you can do dash E, and you can run scripts and whatever else. It's a nice, simple way to actually distribute a fully portable uh, Ruby implementation with everything included in one file. 
one question that I have is, I mean, I did Java back in college, and I haven't had to, so I'm happy about that, but I'm really sold on, on deployment, and that's what interested me, especially the thought that if I could add more machines and press a button and have them run in my same app, that really interests me. My problem is, though, I haven't deployed in Java in quite a long time, so how easy or hard it is to to do that. You know, what are what is the easiest path, right? Well, I'll tell you the steps that I use to set up a demo. Uh, I'll be using Glassfish, which is Sun's open source app server, which is pretty nice. It's fast. It's brand new, so it doesn't have a whole lot of cruft in it. But I download it. I run the setup script, start the server, and then I go to the web interface that says deploy, and I give it the path to the Rails WAR file, or the application WAR file I've got. And that's about it. That's pretty much all there is to it. So it's it's get, gotten to the point where it's really simple. Uh, obviously, if you start setting up things like clustering, you have to have all the network details worked out. But for a single server running as many Rails apps as you want, as many requests uh, concurrently as you want, uh, that's about as easy as you can possibly get. And all of the app servers have a similar interface for that. It's basically start it up and deploy. For that matter, uh, Glassfish has built-in clustering. So once you actually get that set up, I believe once you just deploy, it's going to deploy it to the cluster. So. And that yeah, I think I think we have to cut it off because we're going to be kicked out of here. But you know, we're around for questions, and we'll we'll stick around out in the hall for anybody that wants to talk to us afterwards. So thanks a lot. <laughs>